Okay guys, here's the situation. What we have is uh, 0600 this morning, uh, Navy pilot, an aircraft was shot down over a no-fly zone. The pilot apparently ejected safely and has been abducted by the enemy. Uh, that's in locating and operating in the area. We do know that the terrorist or the uh, enemy that is working in this area uh, is linked to several terrorist groups that operate and train from these, these areas. Our mission simply is we're going to go in, we're going to find you, we're going to secure him, bring him back home. That's what we're doing. Look at the chart here. These are the essential phases of the operation. Build the deck, which we've already completed. We're going to transit to the airfield. Load the aircraft. From via the aircraft, we're going to transit to the drop zone. We're going to conduct the airdrop, which will be a water jump. All right. This is our drop zone here. We'll be dropping the boats in here, out at sea. Approximately 1,500 yards in the coordinates I've given to the uh, pilot. Uh, of course, we once we drop in, of course, we head to the beach. It's course 085. Once we get about three, four hundred yards off from the beach, we're going to just parallel the beach. We're head, heading south. Once we get to this inlet right in here, we will hug the coastline. The key issue here will be the surf. Once we get there, we'll, we'll, the surf is supposed to be two to three feet, so we shouldn't have a surf problem. But we will have to negotiate that surf zone somewhere around here, so that's going to be a critical point. Once we get through that surf zone, we'll just hug this shoreline here, with this northern shoreline, work our way in to this inlet area. This is a highly swamped area.
All right, uh, the next section we want to talk about is range estimation. And before we talk about that, we want to know and deal with some of the factors that uh, impact making a good estimation. I have a little chart up here on the uh, Federal 308 uh, match, uh, same thing, military, basically the same cartridge of military shooting. And <clears throat> what I have represented up here is uh, basically the bullet drop. Uh, at, at 100 to 200, we're actually, we have, on this particular diagram, we have a 300 yard zero. That means uh, the trajectory of the bullet is impacting uh, point of aim, point of impact at 300 uh, yards. And it just progressively drops off from here. You, can, you know that uh, 1,000 uh, yards, we're looking at about 32, 33 feet of drop. So it's, it's uh, exceedingly important that we intersect. Obviously, if we have a target out of 500, 600, 700, we're going to have to make this arc intersect. Uh, the point of impact. So uh, that's where ra our range estimation becomes critical. Unlike a competitive shooter uh, who knows his range, a sniper out there doesn't know it. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the methods to get a good accurate range estimation. Also, what's interesting to note as obviously as the bullet goes down range, it's starting to lose uh, energy, actually kinetic energy. Uh, if, I, if I could measure the foot pounds at the muzzle, uh, when the bullet actually leaves the barrel, I'm looking at about uh, 2,600 pounds. And then as it, it travels out to, uh, actually about out to 100, looking at about 2250, and as you get out to about 500, it, it starts losing energy, and we're looking at about uh, 1150 or so, and just progressively drops off. So bullet energy is dropping off. All right. Now, there's, there's a, what we want to do is be aware of some um, angular measurement systems. H how are we going to actually determine what to set our sights uh, to get that point of aim, point of impact uh, at the desired range? Uh, real familiar to everybody is we could divide a circle up in degrees. And what's familiar to people is uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. Uh, right angle is defined by 90 degrees. Something else that the sniper is going to use is uh, radiance. That's the dividing the circle. 360 divided by 2 pi, a right angle equals pi divided by 2 radians. And I'll go into this explanation a little bit more. Another method, uh, grads, dividing the circle by 400, we're not going to use that, but that's used uh, by other, uh, by artillery and other uh, people uh, when they're really interested in trajectory. Uh, 90, a right angle is represented by 100 grads. Okay. So we'll just we'll, uh, get back to degrees and radians in a second. It's really important. Okay, most of you are familiar with the term mill, and the mill dot, uh, basically the Marine Corps brought it into uh, popularity in the 70s, and almost every tactical scope you see is going to have some kind of mill dot system in it, or if you have a pair of binoculars, you're going to see a mill scale in there. And somebody told me, hey, use this formula, and, you know, take the size of the target and mills, and they, and they just toss these terms out. Nobody ever really explained to me what a mill was. So we want to kind of backtrack and know what a mill is so that when we say, uh, we use that term, we know where it came from and what's involved here. Okay, essentially, mill is short for mill radian, or one thousandth of a radian. Fairly simple. What is a radian? Well, I got the definition right up here. A unit of angular measure equal to the angle subtended at the center of a circle by the arc of length equal to the radius of the circle, okay? A mouthful. What I'm looking for uh, is this angle here, and essentially what I do is I just take the, I go from the center point of the circle, I draw the radius out. I take the length of that radius and I drop it down until it touches the circle again, and then I just essentially draw back, and I got a triangle here, and that represents an angle. It also be defined by 360 divided by 2 pi, and I have a degrees, minutes, and seconds number up here, 57, 17, 44.6. Uh, I could also express that in decimal degrees if I wanted to. So, 57 degrees approximately is a radian. So, a mil radian is 1 1,000th one of that, 0. 0, uh, 0.0057, all right? What is a mil radian, uh, excuse me, 0 0.057? What I'm looking at is 1,000th of a radian, approximately 0 0.057. What's interesting about radians, and this is why uh, we use them out there when we're trying to determine distance, if I had a target that was one meter tall, uh, that would be the height of my triangle, and on the, the uh, 
long leg of the triangle, I drew one, uh, 1,000. Let me just walk over to the VAP board to make it easier to explain over here. The interesting thing about a mill radian is if I took a target and made it one meter tall, and I came back 1,000 meters, and I drew the hypotenuse back to that, this angle right here, represented right there, would be one mill radian, 0 0.057 degrees. So what I'm looking at is one mill radian, 1,000 meters, one meter tall. Simple, one, one, one. It's important, it's easy for us to work with those kinds of numbers in this system. Let's talk about typically what we see in a mill dot scale. What's interesting about the mill dot scale, and it's typically called a three quarter minute mill dot reticle. So I'm, al I'm already mixing degrees with radians here in this particular system here. What, what the three quarter minute mill dot actually means is that this is approximately three quarters of a mill, although it's not, excuse me, three quarters of a minute, although that's not, it's, it's just an approximate measurement. But as I'm looking up here, between or from center to center dots or from the center point of uh, center here on my reticle to the center point of my dot I'm looking at one mil and this is all going to come into play when we're actually trying to measure something out we need to know what this little scale is telling us so center to center we're looking at one mil between the dots we're looking at three quarters of a mil and the dot height is actually one quarter of a mil so we have a few different types of measuring devices in our reticle Okay, actually using the reticle. Got a, a human silhouette out here, and the man's represented at 3.75 mils. Real simple, one, two, three, and about three quarters of a mil. I want to, I want to be very precise when I go ahead and measure somebody uh, to try to get accurate range estimation. The further the target is, especially past 600 yards, my, uh, uh, mil, my milling, the target has to be extremely accurate. Just remember that thing is starting to drop off the uh, extremely fast. No important. We're going to come back to this number, 3.75. I want you guys to go ahead and jot that down in your notes. And we're going to talk about what that means, or we're going to do a few equations that will help us uh, get a good range estimation. Okay, let's back up here for a second. Finding the range. A couple different ways to do it. We can use degrees. Or we can use mills, and I'll talk about both. both. Mills are, are degrees are more difficult. Uh, we don't have a scale on our scope that measures degrees accurately. We do have one that uses mills. Essentially, here's your two uh, uh, formulas. If I was just going to do it in degrees, the height of the target in yards or meters divided by the tangent of the angle that I measure right here. So I need some kind of protractor, some kind of device to measure the angle, and that's essentially what I'm doing with a mill dot, is going to give me distance to the target. What we typically use, and it's a lot easier to work with, is we take the height of the target in yards or meters, multiply it by 1,000. So a typical man is 2 yards. So the number on top is almost always 2,000. We're dealing with um, human targets, or if we only get a half target, we, we put that into computation. And then we mill them. So we just take the size, the known size, or estimated size of the target. We divide it by the mills. And remember that number, 3.75. And that's going to give me distance in yards or meters, whatever scale I'm using. It's going to be consistent all the way through. Real simple uh, trigonometry right here. That's what, that's what range estimation is built upon. We, we're estimating this. We're measuring the angle, either in degrees or, in our case, mils. And we want to find D, or the distance to the target. Okay, I'm going to go through the more complicated one first and just show you how they interrelate. Let's just say we had, we had a good way of measuring the uh, angle or the size of the target in degrees. There's our formula. We've seen it. Size of the target is a man, two yards. We somehow measured the angle and it came out to 0.2148592. We got real precise. And we, if I go ahead and spit this up on my little scientific calculator, I'll come up with 2 over 0 0.00375. Hey, that's a familiar number. All right? Notice it's, it's jumped over here a couple uh, decimal places from our mill, 3.75. And if you just go ahead and do the math, you'll look at it and say 
yards or meters to the target. So that's doing it in degrees. Back to reality, a little simpler method. Size of the target in yards or meters times a thousand divided by the size of the target in the mills gives us distance. Real simple. The size of the target is two multiplied by a thousand. So we always know two thousand. Divided by what we measured them in our mill scale. 3.75 gives us distance. Piece of cake. 533 yards to the target. Alright. Any questions on how that works? Essentially, we just use that mill scale. We want to be very uh, accurate, very precise with it. We want to do it two or three times. If we have a spotter with a mill scale, we want him to do the same thing. Very, very critical that we get that distance correct. All right. Now, there's other things that affect our range estimation, and one of them is slope. For instance, if I was the shooter, and this is my target, I'm shooting on a 10 degree, and I could estimate that or, me or measure that. I might measure it using a topo mat or some other method, I know that I'm shooting on a 10 degree down angle. Now this could be either way. I could be shooting up 10 degrees or down 10 degrees. It doesn't matter. Don't get confused. So let's say I, I went through my mill scale uh, estimation. I came up with 725 yards to the target, but I also estimate that I'm shooting on a 10 degree uh, down slope. Well, there's a factor, and I'm going to show you the table here in a second, but I just simply take the, the estimation multiply it by 0.98 and I come up with a new number of 711 yards. So basically what I'm trying to say, uh, the steeper the angle, up or down, the shorter the distance becomes. And the more precise you must be measure in measuring or estimating the slope of the angle. In other words, if I'm looking at 45 degrees or 50 or 60, I really have to uh, spend some time verifying the angle of that slope because it's going to have greater impact on my range estimation. Right. And I'm going to quickly, you can, this is in your notes. There's a little scale here, and you can essentially see the greater the angle, the, the factor changes. It becomes a smaller and smaller number. It has greater and greater uh, impact on what's happening in terms of your range estimation. All right, so you guys can go over that. Uh, this is something you may want to carry with you. Uh, I didn't come up with a nice little formula to generate this, so uh, just, you might want to uh, scale that down and keep it with you when you're out there in the field. Okay, another term that we use is minute of angle. And I, and I briefly alluded to that when I talked about degrees, minutes, and of angle. We, want, we also want to be aware of this when we're talking about uh, changing uh, point of aim, or uh, actually changing our, uh, the uh, increments on our, our scope. Okay, a minute of angle is an angular measure which subtends 1 60th degree of arc. Essentially, it's 1 60th of degree. A second is 1 60th of that. Makes sense. A minute of angle, this height right here, this angle, at 100 yards is 1.047 inches. Essentially, an inch. For ballpark numbers, uh, not a problem. You can use one inch. And then there's the uh, measurement for if you're dealing with meters. Here, we essentially use yards. The minute of angle is 1 60th of degree of arc. Okay, what does that mean to us in practical terms? Okay, original bullet path. Bullet's traveling down this path, and we decide to go ahead and dial in one minute of angle, right windage adjustment. We want the point of impact, impact to move over. Okay, I just went and go ahead, and again, this is in your notes. We look at it simply at 200 yards. Bullet impact is going to be changing about two inches. 400, about four inches. 600, about six inches. To get out to 1,000, we're, we're getting closer to 10 and a half inches. All right. Again, for all intents and purposes, one minute of angle is about is basically an inch. It's an easy way to remember it. So when I'm taught, when we go out there and we go ahead and sight in our weapons and we go ahead and uh, make calculations for wind and light and all those good things, you basically know what kind of impact this is going to have on your bullet uh, downrange. These adjustments are too coarse, so consequently most scopes are uh, set up for, and the ones we're using are set up for quarter minute of adjustment. So in other words, we could take every one of these numbers, divide them by four, and, and that represents one click. Okay? So essentially at 200 yards, we're looking at a half an inch adjustment by, for one quarter minute of angle. All right. Another thing that affects your bullet path uh, down there, and it's, it's uh, extremely important, obviously is wind. 
and wind is uh, a definitely an art in terms of calling your wind. Uh, you, you, you guys, as you're out on the range, you're going to go ahead and uh, start looking and working with your spotter, reading your mirage, reading indicators downrange, uh, reading indicators at the muzzle, to determine exactly what that wind velocity is. And it takes time behind the gun. It takes, uh, uh, we're going to go out there and we're going to get into some uh, competitions. We're going we're to talk with people that know how to call wind and we're going to ask them, what are you looking at for wind? You need to know how to read wind. You need to go out there and take a look at what's happening in an unknown condition and say, I got this much wind. You have to do that with a, a great degree of confidence. All right, we call, we, we have different values of wind. We have full value, half value, and quarter value winds. In other words, depending on which direction the wind is uh, to us in relation to us, for instance, our bullet path is this way, wind is acting at a 90 degree perpendicular angle to the uh, bullet path. So we call that a full value wind. What I've done and what what's, makes it easy for me, I, rather than bring out a bunch of tables and charts and, and all kinds of things that I do up on uh, trying to keep myself managed out there, I just remember a real simple formula. Range times velocity equals uh, wind correction in minutes of angle. And what I mean by that, let's say I have a 600 yard range estimation. I estimate my target to be 600 yards. For range, I'm just going to go ahead and fill in a 6 here. 6 times the velocity. So let's assume we have a 10, we estimate the wind to be 10 miles per hour. So we're looking at 60 on top. 60 divided by 10 is 6. So my correction at 600 yards for 10 mile an hour wind that's traveling from left to right is going to be 6 minutes of angle. I need to push that, uh, those sights into the wind 6 minutes of angle. Any questions on that? And this works for full value all the way out to, uh, uh, it's a field expedient formula, range times velocity, and then what you need to know on full value is 10. Following that same concept, when we have a half value wind, okay, half value means it, it's quartering like this. Uh, our quarter value is going to be like this, our half value is here, our full value is here. What I need to remember is the number 15, range times velocity divided by 15 is going to give me my correction. Notice the number on, on the bottom is increasing. So say, uh, doing the same calculation, if I had 600 yards for range, 10 miles an hour wind, we're looking at 60 divided by 15, what is my minute of angle correction? Mike, what's my correction for that? Four. Okay, so I need to, I need to go ahead and move my sights four minutes of angle. Okay, in our case, 16 clicks. We're doing quarter minute. Okay, now we have the quarter value. You can see it's getting close to what we call, one other value I didn't mention was called a no value wind. That means if it's coming over your back or hitting you in the face, no value. You don't have to make any wind corrections. Number bumps up to 21. So the three numbers you have to remember, full value, 10. Half value is, anybody remember what that was? 15. Okay, 15. And then Finally, quarter value, 21. No value, we don't worry about it. That means shooting over our back, we're coming right at us. Okay, we've briefly discussed some of the factors that uh, impact range estimation, uh, getting our bullet down on, down on the target first shot, and also a little bit of wind calling. There's some other factors that play on this. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to construct a range card around that. And this is just an example. It's a real nice one I ginned up on my computer. But obviously when you're out in the field, you want to just get yourself a template, something like this, take it out there with you. The reason being is we want to try to take into, uh, into account as many things as we can before we have to make that shot. So what I've done here is this is where basically where my FFP or my final firing position happens to be. And I just start uh, sketching out what I'm seeing. I, got a, I, got a, uh, I uh, may have something that uh, helps me estimate uh, my uh, trees, I may just make a ballpark guess and say I, I believe through uh, experience that that's out about 600 meters. I may be looking at a map that tells me that this stream and this body of water runs right through this area. So I want to go ahead and sketch that out. I may go ahead and mill out these uh, helicopters, know, know their height, and I'll place them out at this, this angle. I want to orient, go ahead and orient it to north. I can use grid, I can use my GPS, I can do all those things I can to go ahead and sketch accurately and I only put a few things on there just for clarity, but I want to sketch the thing in. I have a road, uh, terrain features, I have it all in here. Why I want to do that is if I have someone walking from 
getting out of this helicopter or going from this building to this helicopter and he happens to be traversing right in front of me, I can quickly determine the range that he's in. I'm not, I don't want to be doing all those calculations and those things I talked about at the last minute. At the same time, I'm staying up with my wind the whole time. I'm working with my spotter and I'm reading the wind. If I, uh, as I'm looking out here, I'm, I'm reading that wind out there and I'm already, I've already dialed it in. I'm staying on top of it the whole time. I'm active. So I'm going to go ahead and use this range card to uh, just help, help myself get a, a reasonable probability of getting a first shot on target. Uh, something else I don't have represented here, but it's, a, it's I use a field sketch, maybe a three-dimensional perspective look of the target. And if, you, if time permitting, I'll go ahead and use that also. Just to give myself uh, visual references of what's happening out in front of me in the area I'm trying to control with my uh, weapon. Okay, are there any questions basically about wind calling or uh, any other factors? Yes? Uh, when you're calling wind, are you more concerned about the uh, wind at, at your muzzle or the wind on the target? That's an excellent question. Uh, wh what, I, what I do is just simple physics. We know that if the bullet, if the deflection of that bullet is, is, uh, is impacted at all at the muzzle, it's going to have a greater distance or greater impact down range. So I personally am really concerned about that first 300 meters of wind. I'm really going to scope that out, uh, be aware of it, and then I'm going to go ahead and read my other wind down range. I may have a wind coming from right to left right here, and then I may have something a no value out here and something else happening down there. It's a little bit of a, it's not a real exact science, but I'm, I'm really going to pay attention to the wind at the muzzle primarily and then I'm going to work my way out and through experience it's going to tell me uh, how those other winds are going to affect what's happening down there. Okay, experience is going to tell you. Yes? How does the lighting affect the point of impact? Okay, it does. It, it, and what it does, it, there's an optical illusion. Basically, the rule of thumb is this. Lights up, in other words, the light is up, sights up. Light down, sights down. Light right, sight down. So follow the light. That's all you got to remember. And again, when we're out in the range, uh, let me go ahead and uh, I'll pull this up for you. Uh, when we're out in the range, we're going to go ahead and keep track of our weapon. And we're going we're to have a log book of our weapon. Every time we shoot the weapon, we're going to note the lighting conditions. We're going to note the temperature. We're going to note the wind conditions. We're going to note any other details on this thing and we're going to get a personality for the rifle and the optics. We want to know uh, with a high degree of confidence how that thing's going to affect. When I know I got light up at 45 degrees off of my right, how's that rifle, how are my groups being affected? I need to know that. So basically I need to know my rifle and I do that through logging. Okay, but that was a great question. Follow the light essentially. All right, we have the shooter down in this position here. This is the prone position. Main thing you want to look at here is we want to establish what we call the natural point of aim. We establish that by basically just getting in this position, closing your eyes, getting comfortable, relaxing, open your eyes, look down range, and look where that rifle is pointed. That means you're comfortable behind the gun, everything's set. Now, it may be uh, to the right or left of the target. Now what you're going to do is you're going to index your whole body. You're not just going to move the rifle just because you, you're, you push yourself out of that natural point. So what you can do is you actually index the whole body to that natural point of aim. That's how we establish that. Now we have this nice relaxed point of aim. Now we want to look at our breathing. We want to be able to get our shot off in about a five second window and as we breathe in, the shooter's going to breathe in going to exhale, and he gets to a point where his lungs are empty and he's dead still. You have about a five second window there to get a shot off. Nothing's going on with the lungs, so we're nice and still. That's when we get our shot off. We also want to look at breathing. We want to be able to keep our chest off the deck. Picks the chest on the deck will pick up the breathing, excessive moving because you're rising up and down, and also your heartbeat will be picked up when you're sitting down there with the chest on the deck. Another thing we want to look at is the trigger finger. We don't want to be what we call dragging wood with that finger up against the stock here. You want to keep that finger away so that your finger is on the trigger and that your finger here is not riding in the stock. You want that finger off the stock so that when that trigger, when trigger finger moves, it moves straight back and there's no effect or turning, actually turning the stock. When you're talking about a thousand yard shot, that's, where you, that's the things that you have to consider. Next, we want to look at 
his bone alignment, how his body's lined up here. And when we talk about it, as we move down, he's got the uh, weapon in his shoulder here. He noticed that he has the, the stock here on his hand. Now what that does is it allows me to, I don't need a hand out here in front because I have the bipod, so I can bring a hand now back in here in the stock. And what I can use that hand for is I can, by changing my fist configuration and my hand configuration, I can raise and lower the elevation of that rifle. And that also provides me a, a, a point, a nice stable point where the bipod and the back part of the gun now sits on a very stable position, not affected by my body. When we look back on the shooter's body, he's relaxed in the arm, shoulder, go back here to the, the, uh, the back. Now, your shooting position is going to be different. Each person has his own little characteristics he may change on his shooting position. The legs, find out what works best for you, but basically you want to have a configuration somewhat like this. Some people might want the legs straight out. Some people like to loop the foot over in the back. Uh, if you're a sniper, you may want to consider, if you, some people like to shoot in this position here, by bringing that up, it just brings your foot up higher in the air. Keeping the feet flat like this rather than keeping the foot up here keeps my body lower to the ground. Now you may think, well, he's looking at the way, but you also have targets that can look at you this way. So that's why you want to keep them feet basically flat to the deck. Your shooting legs, where they end up is pretty much how you're going to shoot, what's going to feel best to you. In this position here, that's where you got to watch making excessive movement. Let's take a, a reload here. He fires a shot. He's going to bring the bolt back. And you'll see as he just brings the bolt back, it's smooth. Nothing's moving. And that is what you want to do. This is minimal movement as possible. Big mistakes here is moving quickly, looking up at the shot, changing the, the gun, getting the body, rolling the body. There's a lot of things you can do here in a, a very critical time after you've made the shot. Now the spotter. Spotter is going to line up right next to the shooter. He is trying to get himself lined up with the, the, uh, the bullet trace. In other words, the bullet's going to leave a trace down the when, when he fires that shot, that bullet's going downrange. It's going to leave a trace to the target. What you're trying to do as a spotter, you're trying to get in line with that trace because you'll actually pick that trace up and you'll be able to see it strike where the, the spot it's supposed to strike. And that point there, you can call where that shot goes. We need to know where that shot goes. If we don't know where the shot goes, we're, we're blind, basically. We don't know what we did downrange. Now, the spotter, he's looking at the big picture. He's, he's evaluating, you might have multiple targets out there. You've got, you've got wind, you've got lighting things to consider. We have slope to consider. We have enemy that may be moving to our rear. He's got to be constantly aware of what the big picture is because this guy is going to be totally in to his particular target. If we have a target we've got to take here and then we have another target to move, he's got to direct the sniper on what he's going to do. So big picture, that's the spotter. That's his job. Now. Once that potter, spotter is able to see that bullet strike, from there they're able to figure out what they've done downrange. And that's very important. You know, that's what our mission is. We've got to know what we did around range when we made that shot. Did we hit? Did we not hit? We may have to take another shot. We have multiple targets. That one's now eliminated. Now can we move to another target? So those are the considerations you have. The spotter has got to do his job. Any other questions? Uh, back to the shooting position. Uh, if the shooter changes his uh, position of the scope as far as level or canning the weapon or changes his relationship, his head position on the, on the weapon, is that going to affect the point of impact downrange? Yes, sir. If what you're talking about is if the weapon is slightly canned. In other words, I, I get over here, I change my body position, and now I can't the weapon to the side. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, that will affect because my, the way my scope and my rifle is shooting, that is how I shot all my shots. When I go to my logbook, that is what that relationship is what I based everything on. Now, once I change that, I change all, all the chemistry, all the geometry that goes along with what I've just done. So, yes, it will affect it. Don't do it. Once we insert, we're going to hide the boats, set up the layup points, send out the snipers from the layout point. At the same time the snipers are being sent out, the patrol is going to start moving to the target.
we move into the subject of training. We're going to be working on known distances, stationary targets, and moving targets. And we will graduate or move up to unknown distances against stationary targets and also moving targets. Now it's very important when we're dealing with a stationary target, we can go out to zero to a thousand yards. Our training will be designed, you should be able to hit a stationary target from zero to a thousand yards. If your target's running, what's the maximum distance you can engage him? What you have here is you have basically two considerations. One is a guy walking and two is a guy running. Now it's not realistic to figure that at a thousand yards, some guy running, you're going to be able to accurately shoot at that target. So, but a man walking, we can definitely shoot or accurately hit a target walking at a thousand yards. So you can figure, if you got a target running, maybe 500 yards, four to 500 yards. If you got a target walking, you should be able to hit him at a thousand yards. Very important to train right if you want to be a good sniper. Right? Training is everything. Okay, spotter, I have 1.5 mils half silhouette. Okay, I call that good. Hey, uh, spotter, go ahead and uh, I give you 1.75 mils. Okay, a little low right on that one, but still in the silhouette. basically, but we want to make sure we touch bases with these things, and there's how to call wind, and temperature effects also on our, uh, what's going to happen with that bullet. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys, we've been through this before, but uh, someone go ahead and, and give me uh, some of the factors that are some of the methods we use to call wind. A person could use Mirage. Okay, you can use the Mirage in your spotting scope. That spotter is going to help you out. Uh, you can pick up that mirage oftentimes in your own scope. But we want to use a high-powered spotting scope. Uh, that, and, and for those of you that have seen that mirage come off the road or anything at optical illusion, uh, excellent way to call wind. Uh, we use the angle and the uh, apparent velocity of that, uh, that mirage to give us a good indicator. We learn how to read that. Okay, another method of calling wind. Yes? Uh, the physical signs on the ground, leaves, trees blowing. Like that. Okay, the physical signs, uh, uh, some of the uh, a light breeze on our face would be zero to three uh, miles per hour. Uh, give me some of the other physical signs and also the velocity associated with them. Oh, raising dust, blowing loose papers around on the ground, trash. Okay, and then what, what velocity am I looking at there? Eight to twelve miles an okay, hour. Okay, eight to twelve miles an hour. Okay, another, another thing that we uh, discussed is that the temperature definitely affects point of impact. And you have a little table in front of you, Dave, I'll go ahead and for, for the benefit of everybody tell us basically what does temperature do to the bullet? Yeah, 300 yards, a change of 20 degrees, the sets updates on one, a change of one minute of angle. So basically the, pro, the concept is temperature down, sights up, temperature up, sights down. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, we want to spend a couple minutes just talking about observation and observation techniques and how we get more proficient at it and uh, what's really key in, in, in observing. As a sniper, uh, one of your main functions is to basically to be able to go ahead and go into an area, take a good look at it, and determine what's there and express that in a very clear way. Uh, what I see happening with a lot of new shooters, a lot of new snipers, a lot of guys out there is they get really rushed in 
in, in their mannerisms and their habits out there, and they do a real sloppy search of what's happening out there. What we do to uh, basically get ourselves uh, mentally uh, stronger to observe, we'll do uh, Kim's games. You guys have all done those before. And essentially what we do is we uh, put uh, various objects on the table, we cover them, we bring it up to the table, we, we pull that uh, uh, cover off for a brief period of time, and put that cover right back on and then you have to describe in great detail uh, each object, what it is, dimension, location, all those things and you spit it back to us so that you, your mind becomes more and more in tune to picking up information, keeping it and then expressing it to somebody else. So we use this drill, Kim's Games, uh, developed and, and used very effectively. What I want to just emphasize is that uh, the key to good observation is being methodical in your search. If this is the area I'm trying to scope and determine what's out there, uh, what typically happens with uh, somebody who's impatient is they just do little spot logical checks of what's happening out there, and they're, they're not at all certain as to what they're looking at out there. And remember, one of your greatest adversaries is another sniper. He knows how you think, he knows how you operate, where you want to shoot, he knows what he's looking for. Uh, you're not worried about the, the ground pounder out there who just who, uh, who's got a, a rifle that can't reach the distances that you can. You're worried about the other guy. So we got to find him. And we know that uh, camouflage techniques that we're going to get into are highly effective. So we're going to have to do a very methodical search. Uh, however you want to break it down. Typically I'll just go ahead and start uh, right where I'm at and I'll just carefully and methodically work my way up and down the grid, so on and so forth. Making sure that I overlap my areas of search, and I go ahead and I continue to do this. It's tedious, it takes mental discipline, but I have to do it. Because if there's a sniper out there, I won't pick him up any other way. It's extremely important. Uh, obviously, just an essential piece of gear is your, is your binos. You've got a wider field of view. Uh, it's easier uh, on you. Both, both the sh uh, shooter and the spotter should have one of these when you're actually looking for targets and scoping out the area. Uh, what you want to do is go ahead, uh, also, as you're in the middle of this search here, you want to go ahead and rest your binos on a particular area, and then when, as you're just sitting in, let's say that's a little field of view I'm looking for, I, I sit there, and even in that field of view, I'll go ahead and just work that little uh, field of view, or I may go ahead and go up and back. It doesn't matter. It's got to be methodical. It's got to be overlapping. And then I'll go ahead and I'll shift my binos over to the next point and continue to search that way. I'm looking for anything that looks unnatural, any lighting conditions that look bad, a uh, shadow where it's not supposed to be, a dark spot where it's not supposed to be. I may see something as, as something just looks like that. It looks like a washer hanging in the tree. That's all it looks like. And that may be all you have to go on. And you go, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the guy I'm looking for. So you have to be very methodical and very patient when you're out there observing. From this layout point, our patrol will move easterly along this, this screen area here, staying with the cover. I don't, I'm not really sure what route we'll take, depending on what I see and what enemy action I see. The snipers will move to these two locations here. Probably, you approximately have about a 600, 600 to 1,000 yard patrolling uh, evolution here to get into position here. Once those snipers get in position, I want them reconning this area. I want vehicle traffic movement, I want enemy patrol movement, the aircraft, and I need a good uh, intel on this target area here, which we suspect that that's where our prisoner will be.
Okay, the next topic we want to talk about is establishing a final firing position. Okay, there's a lot of things you can do right, and there's a lot of things you can do right or wrong when you establish what you think is a great position. You have all that camouflage gear on, you think you're all hiding and hiding in the brush, but a lot of times what you're doing is exactly wrong. Even though you got all the gear, uh, you, somebody can pick you out real easy. And one of the problems you want to do that you, that'll help you is you always want to be looking, uh, uh, as you look at the target, you always want to look at what the target is looking back at you. In other words, how is he seeing me? I want to evaluate myself in relationship to what my target is looking back at me. So if I'm sitting here on a ridge line, and behind me is the blue sky, and I've got my little clump here and my little head, sitting on that ridge line, somebody will easily be able to detect that because the light behind me is actually silhouetting me. Now a lot of times what people don't realize is the light behind me will do exactly that. We know if we take a flashlight and I stand in the hallway and you shine the light behind me, I'm going to be this big black blob standing in the, the uh, hallway. The same effect happens out there in the brush. Even though you may have plants sit here in front of you, that light behind you will make you look like a black blob. Any movement you make, the enemy will be able to pick you up, or the target looking back at you is going to pick you up. Now, it may not necessarily be the sky or the sun. You can be silhouetted with the sun still sitting in front of you. Now, how that works is the sun shining. Say, there's our sun shining. Your, your position. Is there. Now what's happening is the sun is shining, but what's happening is it shines down here on the brush behind you. Now that brush behind you may reflect light back. It could be an open field. It could be just a bunch of bright colored leaves. And what happens is that light reflects back through you behind your, in your position. So now what you're doing is you're sitting in the bush, but behind you, because the sun is lighting up the brush behind you, you are silhouetted through the trees. So now he looks through the trees. On the other side of that, the sun is lit, nice lighting up the area. And here you are, this clump, sitting in the nice, c pretending you know, to hot. Now, probably have, you may set up that FFP at a certain time of day, and then that sun changes on you. And it may, at one time of day, your lighting is good. The next time of day, it changes on you. So that's something you have to be aware of. Is this, as you sit out there for a full course of a whole day, that sun is traveling across the sky. So your lighting changes constantly. So it's something you always have to be aware of. Now, so you have to be aware of the color, the lighting, and also sitting in obvious places. You know, if you're gonna, if you're out there sitting in, in a tree clump area, and it's the only tree clump area in the in the field, that's obviously that's where the sniper would be hiding. So you have to constantly evaluate things like that. You have to constantly be thinking what he's gonna be looking at, what's obvious to him. What would be obvious to me? Now another thing you want to do what you want to do is clear a bullet path. In other words, I have this brush and my big old muzzle sticking out there. First off, anybody with binoculars looking, scanning, knowing what they're doing is going to pick up that muzzle. So we know that I have to pull that muzzle back and get it from an area where it's not visible. So if I do that, and now I have the brush in front of me. So I'm thinking, well, hey, can't see my muzzle. But it's what's going to happen to those reeds when you fire that gun? Mike, what's going to happen when those, that muzzle goes off and what's going to happen when you see it? It'll move the brush or leaves in front of the gun. That's exactly right. So now you're, you're sitting out here in the brush, you're all nice and hiding, you got your clump, you got all the gear, you're hiding, take the shot, and what the bad guy sees or what your target that you're aiming at looks, he, can even, he doesn't even have to be looking and catch it out in the corner of his eye. Watch as a bush go like this, a bunch of brush. <clears throat> and that's what he's going to pick up. He will catch up that movement because it's going to be very visible to him, if, even if he's looking in the general direction. 
So it's one, something you have to be aware of. So that will, now what we have to do is we have to clear a bullet path. We're going to still use these same reads, but what the bad guy's going to look at These reeds will be in front of it, but you've cleared a path through the reeds. In other words, this is what's looked at, and I have a path cut through those weeds or sticks or whatever, and I'm back. And I'm also trying to get back into the shadows. The farther I can get back into the darkness, the less likely he's going to see anything as far as my muzzle. My muzzle will actually blend in because the lighting it looks the same. So my muzzle sticking out there where the light can pick it up, it's going to be visibly, uh, uh, they'll be able to see it from these different angles. But there are some other reasons that we might want to consider clearing a bullet path. Um, to keep any twigs or grass from deflecting a bullet? That's exactly correct. That bullet's coming out of there at 2,600 feet per second or so, depending on the type of weapon and ammo you're using. When it hits that little stick or that reed, it's going to deflect it right there. And when you're talking about a thousand yard shot, you're talking about quite a bit of a deflection. Yes, it will affect the uh, effect of the bullet. Also, when the muzzle blast comes out, it's going to hit these sticks and cause them to move. Now, you, reason, you also want to clear a dead space so that that muzzle blast, you may be sitting back here in the brush, back here, and you've got your bullet path in this brush here, but there's a dead space between you and the next set of uh, brush or weeds or whatever you got in front of you. Now, what's going to happen is you're sitting back here, you fire the shot. Nothing is seen here that muzzle blast is allowed to dissipate before it gets into this next set of brush. So you've got actually a double set of cover between you and that muzzle blast. Unloading. You realize now you're sitting here in a high. Somebody's looking at you. You've just fired a shot. All of a sudden, all eyes are going to be looking for you. If you sit there and take that weapon and move it quickly, when you unload the rifle, or you move up, or you move your head, or your spotter's moving around, these can be detected. So the key here is when you unload, that loading technique, which we, we work on, which we practice, has got to be a smooth, very uh, uh, ritualistic technique. Now, as you do it, you do it the same way every time. You're not looking up. You're not having to adjust the rifle. The rifle's not plopping down the scope. All these things can affect somebody looking back at you. So unloading. Very important technique. Also, remember, what are we going to do with our brass once we've fired a shot? Oh, you're going to want to take it with you. You're not going to want to leave anything out there after you leave your uh, final firing position. When you leave that FFP, it's very important that nobody knows that you were there. Or if they have to, they have to be an expert tracker to know that you were in that area. It's almost impossible to stop an expert tracker, but most people are not going to be able to see it if you can leave and not leave any signs that you were there. Once they know where you were, they know exactly what to start tracing to find you. Now, one thing you want to realize is when you move into this FFP, you just can't sit here and walk straight in and make this straight beeline into your FFP. Anybody looking at that or anybody trying to follow you is going to be able to pick that up. In other words, you've just left this nice clear path straight to where you're at. In other words, you could probably just sit there and look and follow the, follow the lines and go, yeah, there he is. So what you want to do is you want to think in terms of reading your terrain, and you're going to try to zigzag into this FFP. You're moving in. You may have different. It's not going to be a trail. It's going to be easy to follow as you get into this FFP. Another thing you want to do is be aware where your target is. If you have a hill, they have a hill. And I have a target. Well, obviously, between me and the hill, or it could be a large grove of trees, I can move quickly. This is when I can patrol in a standing position. I can move quickly in this, in this position here. Now, as I get closer to my target or that the train starts opening up, say I got a field or I'm, I'm starting to now move down a slope where he can see me clearly, then I've got to start slowing down my movement as I get closer. Maybe I've got to clump of trees on top of this hill. So I just have to start looking at getting into maybe a kneeling position or a low crawl or a high crawl movement. Once I start getting on this flat side of that hill, we're talking serious low crawl. You're really concentrating on that zigzag technique. As you're looking down at the hill and somebody crawls straight down that hill, you might be able to get a lawnmower 
and mow that, this, that hill because that's exactly what they're going to see. So you got to make sure you zigzag down that hill and you're going to have to crawl. And that's that's going to be your longest part probably of your stock is just moving in those. And that's the most critical time trying to move that. You may have a great spot down here for a great shooting position, great final firing position. And to get that, I've got to go 20 or 30 yards in a real critical area. So that's where I'm going to be in my low crawl, really looking at that zigzag and getting into that excellent spot. Now one thing you also got to be realize after you fire that shot, when you consider your, last, your final firing position, once you fire that shot, you got to get out of there. You always got to leave yourself an out. You can't be going, making a shot and then getting up the hill and running back up the hill. You're going to have to get a place where you make that shot and now you can't just sit here and spend four hours crawling back up on that hill. You have to figure out ways that you can get out of there. Maybe do a, a high crawl or a, a kneel on your knees or whatever. But you want to get it so that you can move quickly to get out of that area so that you can finally get to the back side of the hill where you can actually get up and start taking off. So that's another thing. Not, what works really good is little trenches in the hills where you've got ditches, drainage areas where you can actually get down there and do a you know, low crawl or high crawl on your knees and you can move quickly through that area where you're not spending four hours going a yard at a time. That's one thing. You gotta, that's experience. You get out there, do it, screw, you, know, you screw it up on the field, you look at it, you spot and looking at other people when you're doing these drills, you'll see other people going, oh man, that's obvious, gee whiz. So one thing I always want to do, what I always do when I'm moving or stalking into an area, I'm always going to so many yards and what I do is I, I take a look back at the train that I'm in and I look at where I've just been because that's telling me what they're looking at. That's what they see. So that always helps me figure out, well, that's what they're looking at. If I'm, oh gee whiz, I'm, this is kind of dumb here, I can see that this bright field of yellow flowers is going to silhouette me when I get up to this brush. So that's not a good spot. So those are things also when you're scoping out there and you're looking down at the train down below you, you're looking at these hot areas, I call them hot areas. Whenever I see a field that's got the sun on it and I see the bright lights on it, that to me is hot. In other words, it's like, it's like having a light behind you, like a big beam. So I don't want to be in those areas. I don't want to be silhouetted by those areas. So those are things you do. Just as you get out there, you practice, you get better at doing it. Here's a classic rookie mistake. You're crawling along, you're being really stealthy. You've, you've pulled everything off, you're, you're moving good, but all of a sudden something snags on your belt. You know? and, and as you're crawling, you feel it, and you, you just say, ah, I'm just going to pull my way through it. And all of a sudden, that tree or that branch that you're on, now all of a sudden starts flexing and flexing and flexing, and all of a sudden it's going to release. <laughs> now, what, you've, what have you just done? You would essentially be flagging the enemy. You flag the enemy, so I'm over here. Now you got to realize if people are looking for you, they don't need to even be looking at you. When they see something like that, you're just going to catch it. You go, whoa, what was that? Why is that branch moving out of nowhere? There's you know, the wind. If you have wind out there, the wind makes things just kind of move at a constant pace. Well, if you go out there and clang something, or you hook up on something, and you drag it, and all of a sudden it releases, they're going to pick that up. And when you got a lot of eyes looking for you, somebody's going to know, there he is. And you like, when you're out there practicing, you'll see it. Sometimes you get hung up on something, and you try to push it and it just keeps moving. You just gotta, you gotta work your way. You gotta release it, get it off you, and make sure you're not waving at the enemy. All right, now, another thing we wanna cover, another area that we wanna really talk about is the map itself, map and compass. It's very important that you take this topographical map and study, study it. That's gonna show you, you sit here and you study this thing and you can go, okay, there's, you can look at the characteristic of the country you're gonna be in. A lot of times you don't realize, but if I'm sitting in a position and I haven't really studied my topographical map, I may see a hill out there in front of me and not realize that on the other side of that hill is, is something else because I haven't studied my topographical map. I don't know what's on the other side of that hill. It's very easy to be deceived by what you see out there, by reading a topographical map and understanding the area because it gives you an understanding of what this area is uh, alike. It'll help you understand the outs. When you get there, you just understand the feel of the way the the land lays, what's behind you, even though you're not able to see it, maybe you're on a hill where you're looking this way, but because you're, you're understanding your map, you're knowing how you're, you're studying it, you understand how my out's going to be. And once I've made my shot, it'll help me figure out where my out's going to be. It'll also help me figure out where my routes are. It just gives me a, a basic understanding of the area that I'm dealing with. The, the threat can be in different direct areas, and it may have materialized at a time I'm not expecting. I'm thinking the threat's here, all of a sudden the threat is over here. I need to know how that relates to all the terrain that I'm dealing with.
Once those snipers get in position, I want them reconning this area. I want vehicle traffic movement, I want enemy patrol movement, the aircraft, and I need a good uh, intel on this target area here, which we suspect that that's where our prisoner would be. Snipers generally will carry a handgun. The SEALs prefer the SIG P226, which they carry on their patrols, the 9mm double action, some automatic pistol. Other snipers tend to prefer a customized model 1911. This particular pistol would normally have a black finish for field use at, by, at, by snipers. These pistols are both being held and Blackhawk Industries uh, tactical holsters. Olympic Arms service rifle, it's similar to the M16A2, carried at, by, as, by spotters in most sniper patrol teams. This is the Olympic Arms uh, CAR-15. In certain situations, a spotter may choose this rifle over the larger version for ease of transport. It's also a 223 caliber version of the AR-15 M16. This is a Bushnell Space Master spotting scope. It's the same spotting scope currently in use by the SEAL teams. It's a 15 to 45 variable with a 60 millimeter objective lens. Over here, we have a Palza 50 caliber semi-automatic rifle. This rifle has a fixed barrel, built fixed micro-rock barrel. It's capable of shooting half minute of angle and 50 caliber sniper rifles are generally employed for extended range sniping of 1500 meters and beyond. 
This rifle has a Macmillan Vision Master 2.5 to 10 sniper scope. This rifle is a Remington Model 700 with a Macmillan stock and a Mike Rock 5R barrel. The rifle is 7.62 caliber. The scope, as you can see, has target knobs to adjust it, which is mandatory for a sniper scope. This rifle is made built by Armament Technology in Canada. It's 7.62 rifle. This particular rifle has won two Canadian sniping championships. It's topped with a loophole Mark IV 10 power scope with a three quarter mil dot reticle, as talked about in the classroom earlier. The barrel is a Mike Rock 5R barrel. It has been blackened. It's a stainless steel barrel that's been blackened for use in sniping. This is a Mike Rock 5R barrel. What makes this barrel unique is the five land and five groove rifling. The sidewall of the groove is cut at a 110 degree angle, which causes less deformation as the bullet swaged into the bore and a more even pressure curve as the bullet accelerates down the barrel. These are the same barrels used in the Army's M24 sniper weapon system. They have an outstanding service life, which currently is outperforming or outperforming any other barrel on the market. This is the loophole Mark IV M1 telescope. It's been fitted with three-quarter mil dot reticle. It is the current sniper scope used by combative concept sniper instructors. And it is felt to be one of the best scopes on the market. This is Task 2 Tactical Mic by Television Equipment Associates. It has a push to talk switch that can be Velcroed onto the side of the rifle so the sniper can uh, work his headset without being moved out of position. It works out of the, on the left ear only because the stock's up against the sniper's right ear. The headset's been cut down to a half inch. It'll even fit under a ballistic helmet. This is a lash throat mic, also by Television Equipment Associates. It hooks onto the sniper's throat or anybody on patrol, and it can pick up even a whisper through the vibrations of the throat. The earpiece goes in. It's very small. It does not block hearing in any way and the push to talk switch can be clipped anywhere on the sniper or the patrol or the person on patrol's body. What we have here is a drag bag by Blackhawk Industries. Most snipers use a drag bag due to the fact that it protects the rifle and it's a convenient way to transport it over long distance. This particular drag bag by Blackhawk Industries is designed to be used to carry the rifle in backpack configuration. The straps will come right out. We have a TAC vest from Blackhawk Industries. This is complete with a camelback water sit hydration system. Pocket sewn into the, built into the vest. Camelback system works. It's sloshless and uh, a, a, sil a silent way to carry your water in the field. We're having ready access to it to drink when you're on the move. TAC vest has pockets for compass. Um, any other field gear and magazines. Here we have a Blackhawk ghillie suit. You can see, you can examine the padding going down the front. The sniper spends most of the, a lot of time low crawling on his stomach, and this suit's designed just for that. We have a 16-hour window from the time we drop to the time we expect. We have a 16-hour window in complete mission. Does anybody have any questions? Let's do it. Eagle 2, this is Eagle 1. Be advised, I'm reading two minutes of wind, left to right. Range, 620 yards, to the Jeep at the target center. Eagle 1, I copy. Two minutes of wind, left to right. Range, 620 yards, to Jeep, out. Sewer Rat, this is Eagle 1. You are clear to move to Foxtrot Papa. Roger, Eagle 1, I copy. Proceed. Foxtrot Papa.
have location of pilot. This is Eagle One. I copy Sewer Rat. Set at Foxtrot Papa. Be advised, hotel not located at this time. All stations, this is Eagle Two. I have two vehicles moving east into target location. All stations, this is Eagle One. I have visual of hotel on the left flank of the target. He's being moved by two armed tangos to target center. Eagle One, this is Sewer Rat. Have visual of hotel at this time. Break. Eagle Two, update status on vehicles. Sewer Rat, this is Eagle Two. Vehicles are on target. You should have visual. Roger. I have visual. This is Eagle One Sewer Rat. Have lost sight of hotel. Repeat. Have lost sight of hotel. advised four tangos have exited vehicles at target center. The second vehicle has moved 40 yards to the left flank. All stations, this is Eagle 2. Four tangos have emerged from vehicle located 40 yards on left flank. Update target status. I need number and location of all tangos. Sewer rat, Eagle One. Target status as follows. Left flank, four armed tangos, 40 yards from hotel. Right flank, two rovers, 15 yards, near 10 o'clock. Target center, five armed tangos surrounding hotel. One tango in green suit, unarmed. Total, 12 tangos on target. Eagle One, this is Sewer Rat. I copy your last. 12 tangos on target. Eagle One, designate targets. Roger, Sewer Rat. All stations, this is Eagle One. Be advised, target designation as follows. Eagle One will take Camel Beret. Eagle Two will take Tango with Ponytail. Sewer Rat, multiple target sequence as follows. Take two tangos directly west of hotel, standing on at 6 o'clock carrying assault rifles. Sewer Rat, second targets, two rovers on your 10 o'clock. Sewer Rat, third target, assist on multiple tangos at vehicle 40 yards west of hotel. Weapon on Hotel. Eagle 1 switching to target green suit. Eagle 2 switch to camel beret. Sewer Rat take ponytail. All stations, this is Sewer Rat. We are green. Eagle 1, you are clear to initiate. Sewer Rat, this is Eagle 1. Primary target blocked. I repeat, primary target blocked. Eagle 2, this is Eagle 1. Take green suit. You copy. This is Eagle 2. No shot on green suit. I will have to take him from here. Negative sewer rat, Eagle One clear. One Sierra down, one Sierra down. Sewer rat under fire. Locate unknown threat. Eagle one, this is spotter two. Muzzle flash on sewer rat, 11 o'clock, 300 yards. Check single bolt tree near road. This is Eagle one. Roger, good call. Target located, will engage. 
Olympic Arms and Shoots and Pistol Works, manufacturers of America's most complete line of quality-built firearms and related parts. Our diverse product line includes the famous AR-15 style rifles, now designated as the PCR or politically correct rifle. For almost 20 years, Olympic Arms and Shoots and Pistol Works have been providing safe, reliable, accurate rifles and pistols for use as law enforcement tools military arms and recreational shooting sports. Olympic Arms and Shoots and Pistol Works, a company people have come to know and trust with a dedication to a quality finished product and to our customers. This is my Croc 5R barrel. What makes this barrel unique is a five blend and five groove rifling. They have an outstanding service life, which currently is outperforming or outperforming any other barrel on the market. This rifle is made and built by Armament Technology in Canada. It's 7.62 rifle. This particular rifle has won two Canadian sniping championships and shoots a .189 minute of angle.